Okay, pals, let's talk about the best bad movie ever made. Let's talk about Hawk the Bloody Slayer. <laughs> Hawk the Slayer, 1980 low to zero budget British fantasy movie. Starring somebody you've almost certainly never bloody heard of, but with a ridiculously high profile supporting cast. Hawk the Slayer is, to my mind, unique in that it is universally fondly remembered without being in the least bit highly regarded. Everybody who saw it at the time it came out looks back on it with great affection, but nobody's under the impression that it's any good. Even its staunchest fans and supporters will readily admit that, yeah, it's a bit shit, really. Now, it's been brought to my mind again just recently by uh, two things. One, it is finally getting a kind of sequel in comic book form, written by the great Garth Ennis and published by Rebellion, the 2008 E guys. And secondly, the other day, I found it on YouTube, the whole thing. It's up there. I won't post a link because it's almost certainly not up there legally. But if you haven't seen it in this video in some way piques your curiosity, you can slake that curiosity for free just at the moment. Now, the movie that Orc the Slayer has the most in common with, to my mind anyway, is Roger Corman's Battle Beyond the Stars. Uh, firstly, because they are both yet another remake of The Seven Samurai slash The Magnificent Seven. You know, scrappy, diverse bunch of heroes are convened to save a beleaguered community from bad guys. But also they were both part of that slew of cheapo, quickie Star Wars knockoffs that came out in the last couple of years of the 70s. As evinced by the fact that the bad guy in Hawk the Slayer is essentially wearing a medieval Darth Vader costume. Now, there are, of course, two main differences. Uh, Hawk the Slayer takes the medieval fantasy route rather than the space opera route, probably because it's a lot cheaper. Um, you can film the whole thing in one forest, and they do film the whole thing in one forest. Seriously, almost everything in this movie happens in a clearing in the woods. They have a couple of sets which are big stone rooms. They might actually be the same set. I'll have to have another look. You've got a convent and an abbey and a palace. But other than that, we're standing in clearings in the woods for the whole damn film. In fact, at some point, I'm going to watch it again and see if I can figure out if it's actually the same clearing every time, which it might well be. The second difference, of course, is that while Battle Beyond the Stars is surprisingly good, Hawk the Slayer is surprisingly bad. See, Roger Corman, while the old bird that he was, seems to have thought to himself while he was putting Battle Beyond the Stars together, just because I'm making a cheapo, quickie Star Wars knockoff, it doesn't mean I have to make a bad cheapo, quickie Star Wars knockoff. So he very cleverly employed some extremely promising young people to put that film together. Uh, the script was written by John Sayles before anybody had ever heard of him. The model effects were done by James Cameron before anybody had ever heard of him. The score was by James Horner, who I think was literally about 21. And actually, the big lavish orchestral score for for Battle Beyond the Stars goes some way to making that film feel a lot more expensive than it actually is. And by contrast, the music to Hawk the Slayer by Harry Robertson, who interestingly also gets a co-screenwriting credit, is a composite knockoff of Ennio Morricone's Spaghetti Western scores and Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, which, while doing nothing whatsoever to make the movie feel any more expensive, does absolutely plant it in the Aventies. As followers of the Chart Music podcast will know, the Aventies refers to the notion that the period between about 1979 and 1981 has its own cultural identity being neither the 70s anymore nor quite the 80s yet. Another thing Hawk the Slayer does, which is kind of typical of British projects of the era, is populate the supporting cast with well-known British character actors and import a couple of Americans for the leads. Specifically, Jack Palance and John Terry, not that one. Jack Palance playing the aforementioned medieval Darth Vader bad guy Voltan is... Well, he's Jack Palance, never knowingly underplayed, and he certainly doesn't underplay anything here. By contrast, John Terry, not that one, as Hawk, is underplayed to the point of inertia. It's almost as if he's making a point of being wooden, and I think I actually saw an interview with him once where it's turned out that this was pretty much the case. I think he realised that, surrounded as he was by venerable old British hams biting chunks out of the scenery, he needed to dial it all the way down to create some kind of still point at the centre of the movie. But if anything, he's a bit too still. It's the only movie I've ever seen where the hero is less charismatic than his own sword. Because, of course, there's a magic sword. Because why would there not be a magic sword? And it's actually a really awesome magic sword. Because, yes, they're all in there. you got Ferdy Main, you got Warren Clark, Christopher Benjamin, Derek O'Connor, Patrick McGee, uh, Roy Kinnear, Bernard Breslau, Patricia Quinn. Most of them just get like a, a two or three minute cameo each. And they're all desperately making the most of their screen time. 
But what's so ultimately endearing about Hawk the Slayer, apart from the sheer balls it obviously took to attempt to make it in the first damn place, after two whole trilogies of Tolkien for Peter Jackson and eight seasons of Game of Thrones and two seasons in Counting of the Witcher, it's really rather adorable to see somebody try to create a coherent fantasy landscape just by using a bit of parkland, a smoke bomb and a confused looking snake. But what's also endearing is that no disrespect to Terry Marcel, the co-writer and director, and Harry Robertson, the co-writer, is this movie really feels like it's been written by a couple of 12-year-olds, which is probably why I loved it so much when I first saw it as a 10-year-old. It's just a series of awesome things happening. Hawk goes here and does a thing, and it's awesome. And then he goes here and does a thing, and it's awesome. And then he goes there and does a thing. And it's awesome. And there's supposed to be a plot in there somewhere, but what it actually is, I'm still not sure I can entirely tell you. It's all something to do with ransoming an abducted abbess, but... And that's another thing. So much of this film just doesn't really feel like it's been thought through at all. There are, as I've alluded to, monks and nuns in this movie, and they wear crucifixes round their necks, which would suggest that this is happening in our world. You know, not some completely fantasy world like Middle Earth or wherever the fuck Game of Thrones is happening. It's happening presumably in our world, but where and when in our world the movie doesn't know and doesn't care. It's just days of old. For example, there's no historical continuity whatsoever to the costumes. Most of the bit players are wearing kind of, you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail style medieval garb. But then when Christopher Benjamin turns up as a slightly oily con man, he's wearing a Tudor doublet and cap. And I'm thinking, there's literally 500 years between his costume and his mate's costume. Does anybody care? No, no, no nobody cares. Nobody cares. Even the kind of core relationships between the characters, which are supposed to be moving the whole plot, they don't make any sense at all. Hawk and Voltan are meant to be feuding brothers despite the visible 35-year age gap between the two actors. And this isn't helped at all by the fact that the source of their feud is the fact that at varying times they were both engaged to the same woman. How the hell did that work? Was she engaged to Voltan when she was like six? Also, while we're here, if you have two kids and you name one Hawk and the other Voltan, then you can't really be too surprised when one grows up good and the other grows up evil. There is such a thing as nominative determinism. But I think I've figured it out. I think I've figured out why this film is so fondly remembered, even though everybody knows it's terrible. And it actually all kind of comes back to Doctor Who. You see, 70s and 80s Doctor Who consisted of amazing, mind-bending ideas being rendered in, let's be honest, fairly ropey fashion. You know, the concepts going into these stories were fantastic and revolutionary, and the BBC, bless them, were doing their best to depict these concepts on screen using the incredibly limited resources at their disposal. But ultimately, what stays with you from those stories, if you're a fan is the ideas, and not the dodgy rendering thereof. Similarly, with Hawk the Slayer, it's not so much that everything about it is shit. It's that everything about it is nearly great. And it's almost as if, while you're watching it, it is insidiously remaking itself inside your head as an altogether better movie. And it's that movie that you remember in due course when you look back on it. Quite a clever trick, and I was wondering if Terry Marcel, the writer and director, ever pulled this off again. He had quite the career, um, he's still around, he had quite the career directing TV in the 80s and 90s. Only ever did a few more features. He did one with the incredibly tantalising title of Prisoners of the Lost Universe in 1983, which I haven't seen and can't find anywhere. But, weirdly, and this is something else which brought Hawk the Slayer to mind, is another one of his films recently turned up on Amazon Prime from 1987, Jane and the Lost City. It's an adaptation of the kind of cheesecake adventure newspaper strips from the war, Jane. And I thought, ooh, it's one of Terry Marcel's other ones. I'll give it a go. Oh boy, it's terrible. It re I'm sorry, you know... No disrespect to Mr. Marcel, but I got like 15 minutes in and I thought, no, life is just too bloody short. Whatever else Hawk the Slayer is or isn't it is eminently watchable. Jane and the Lost City is not. Like I said, Terry Marcel has been trying to get some kind of sequel off the ground for 
essentially the 42 years it's been since this movie came out. And I was given to understand that actually some moves were being made in this respect a few years ago. <laughs> I thought I might try and angle for the Bernard Breslow part, although let's face it, they'll ask Greg Davis. How the advent of Garth Ennis's comic strip is going to affect this one way or another remains to be seen. But I was thinking, actually, you know, the best environment for a... Uh, for a Hawk the Slayer remake slash reboot slash sequel, whatever, would be your Netflix or your HBO or your Amazon or something like that. Not just because they'd have a bit more money to spend or one, that one would hope that they'd have a bit more money to spend, but also it would give you a bit of time to, you know, flesh out the world and the characters, maybe define it all a bit more clearly. Although now I'll think about it, let's be honest, The Witcher kind of is a big budget Hawk the Slayer, isn't it? It's a itinerant, handsome sword slinger wandering through a fantastical world, getting into scrapes and rescue damsel but anyway if you've never seen it like i said for at the moment it appears to be up there for free how long it's going to be up there no idea and also i'm going to get the comic strip as soon as i can and maybe i'll tell you what i thought of that okay see you soon thanks for watching if you liked it please hit like and share if you'd like to see more please hit subscribe and if you'd like to help me make more please visit patreon.com slash mitch ben